Good morning. My name is Lieutenant Colonel Jay Graywall, and I am a student from the National War College, class of 2025. It's my privilege and honor to introduce our guest speaker today. Before I get started, guests are reminded that we will not be following Chatham House rules today. And this event is being broadcast to the public. We will have 20 minutes of remarks, followed by 20 minutes of Q&A, moderated by Dr. Rich Andres. Jake Sullivan is a 28th assistant to the President for National Security Affairs. In the Obama-Biden administration, he served as a deputy assistant to the President and National Security Advisor to then Vice President Biden, Director of Policy Planning Staff at the U.S. Department of State, and the Deputy Chief of Staff for the Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton. Please provide a warm welcome to Jake Sullivan. Good morning, everyone, and thanks so much for that introduction, Lieutenant Colonel Graywall. And I also want to thank the National War College for bringing us all together today. I want to thank my colleagues from across the intelligence community and DOD, as well as from the NSC, who uh, have really put their blood, sweat, to uh, toil, and tears into producing this National Security Memorandum on Artificial Intelligence that we're rolling out today. Most importantly, though, I want to thank all of you for allowing me to be here to say a few words this morning. It's truly an honor for me to be here. And in fact, there's a reason I wanted to address this specific group of leaders. More than 75 years ago, just a few months after the Second World War ended, then General Dwight Eisenhower wrote a letter to his fellow military leaders. All around them, the world was changing. Nazi Germany had fallen. Nations were rebuilding. The Cold War was just beginning and people everywhere were reckoning with the horrors of the Holocaust. It was a new era, one that demanded new strategies, new thinking, and new leadership. So General Eisenhower pitched an idea, a national war college. He didn't know where it would be or what exactly it would look like, but he knew America needed a school whose primary function would be, as he wrote, quote, to develop doctrine rather than to accept and follow prescribed doctrine develop, not accept and follow. That idea has guided this institution ever since. In the aftermath of the Second World War, it led your forebearers to reimagine our decision-making apparatus, including the establishment of the National Security Council. Thanks for that. <laughs> During the Cold War, it led them to develop new strategies to advance our national security, including implementing containment, detente, and beyond. And throughout the global war against terror, your predecessors have pioneered new thinking and new tactics that have helped keep our nation safe. Now it's your turn. We're in an age of strategic competition in an interdependent world, where we have to compete vigorously and also mobilize partners to solve great challenges that no one country can solve on its own. In this age, in this world, the application of artificial intelligence will define the future. And our country must once again develop new capabilities, new tools, and as General Eisenhower said, new doctrine, if we want to ensure that AI works for us, for our partners, for our interests, and for our values, and not against us. That's why I'm proud to announce that President Biden has signed a National Security Memorandum on Artificial Intelligence. This is our nation's first ever strategy for harnessing the power and managing the risks of AI to advance our national security. So today, I want to talk to you about what's brought us to this moment and how our country needs all of you to help us meet it. Like many of you here at the War College, I've had to grapple with AI and its implications for national security since I became national security advisor, about what makes it so potentially transformative, and about what makes it different from other technological leaps our country has navigated before, from electrification to nuclear weapons to space flight to the internet. And I've seen three key things in particular. First, the sheer speed of the development of artificial intelligence. The technical frontier of AI continues to advance rapidly, more rapidly than we've seen with other technologies. Let's just take protein folding as an example. 
Discovering a protein structure or how it folds is essential for understanding how it interacts with other molecules, which can solve fundamental puzzles in medicine and accelerate the development of treatment and cures. Up until 2018, humanity had collectively discovered the structure of around 150,000 proteins, largely through manual efforts, sometimes after years of painstaking work using advanced microscopes and x-rays. Then Google DeepMind showed that AI could predict the structure of a protein without any wet lab work. By 2022, four years later, that same team released predicted structures for almost every protein known to science, hundreds of millions in all. Just a few weeks ago, the scientist involved won a Nobel Prize. Now imagine that same pace of change in the realms of science that impact your work as national security leaders every day. Imagine how AI will impact areas where we're already seeing paradigm shifts, from nuclear physics to rocketry to stealth, or how it could impact areas of competition that may not have yet matured, that we actually can't even imagine, just as the early Cold Warriors could not really have imagined today's cyber operations. Put simply, a specific AI application that we're trying to solve for today in the intelligence or military or commercial domains could look fundamentally different six weeks from now, let alone six months from now or a year from now or six years from now. The speed of change in this area is breathtaking. This is compounded by huge uncertainty around AI's growth trajectory, which is the second distinctive trait. Over the last four years, I've met with scientists and entrepreneurs, lab CEOs and hyperscalers, researchers and engineers, and civil society advocates. And throughout all of those conversations, there's clear agreement that developments in artificial intelligence are having a profound impact on our world. But opinions diverge when I ask them, what exactly should we expect next? There's a spectrum of views. At one end, some experts believe we barely kicked off the AI revolution, that AI capabilities will continue to grow exponentially, building on themselves to unlock paths we didn't know existed, and that this could happen fast, well within this decade. And if they're right, we could be on the cusp of one of the most significant technological shifts in human history. At the other end of the spectrum is a view that AI is in a growth spurt, but it has or soon will plateau. Or at least the pace of change will slow considerably and more dramatic breakthroughs are further down the road. Experts who believe this aren't saying AI won't be consequential, but they argue that the last mile work of applying AI that are already here, the capabilities that are already here, is what will matter most. Not just now, but for the foreseeable future. These views are vastly different with vastly different implications. Now, innovation has never been predictable, but the degree of uncertainty in AI development is unprecedented. The size of the question mark distinguishes AI from many other technological challenges our government has had to face and make policy around. And that is our responsibility. As National Security Advisor, I have to make sure our government is ready for every scenario along the spectrum. We have to build a national security policy that will protect the American people and the American innovation, innovation ecosystem, which is so critical to our advantage, even if the opportunities and challenges we face could manifest in fundamentally different ways. We have to be prepared for the entire spectrum of possibilities of where AI is headed in 2025, 2027, 2030, and beyond. Now, what makes this even more difficult is that private companies are leading the development of AI, not the government. This is the third distinctive feature. Many of the technological leaps of the last 80 years emerged from public research, public funding, public procurement. Our government took an early and critical role in shaping developments, from nuclear physics and space exploration, to personal computing, to the internet. That's not been the case with most of the recent AI revolution. While the Department of Defense and other agencies funded a large share of AI work in the 20th century, the private sector has propelled much of the last decade of progress. And in many ways, that's something to celebrate. It's a testament to American ingenuity, 
to the American innovation system that American companies lead the world in frontier AI. It's America's special sauce. And it's a good thing that taxpayers don't have to foot the full bill for AI training costs, which can be staggeringly high. But those of us in government have to be clear-eyed about the implications of this dynamic as both stewards and deployers of this technology. Here, two things can be true at the same time. On the one hand, Major technology companies that develop and deploy AI systems, by virtue of being American, have given America a real national security lead, a lead that we want to extend. And they're also going head to head with PRC companies like Huawei to provide digital services to people around the world. We're supporting those efforts because we want the United States to be the technology partner of choice for countries around the world. On the other hand, we need to take responsible steps to ensure fair competition in open markets, to protect privacy, human rights, civil rights, civil liberties, to make sure that advanced AI systems are safe and trustworthy, to implement safeguards so that AI isn't used to undercut our national security. The U.S. government is fully capable of managing this healthy tension as long as we're honest and clear-eyed about it. And we have to get this right because there is probably no other technology that will be more critical to our national security in the years ahead. Now, when it comes to AI and our national security, I have both good news and bad news. The good news is that, thanks to President Biden and Vice President Harris's leadership, America is continuing to build a meaningful AI advantage. Here at home, President Biden signed an executive order on the development and use of AI the most comprehensive action that any country in the world has ever taken on AI. We've worked to strengthen our AI talent, hardware, infrastructure, and governance. We've attracted leading researchers and entrepreneurs to move to and remain in the United States. We've unleashed tens of billions of dollars in incentives to catalyze domestic leading edge chip production. We've led the world in issuing guidance to make sure that AI development and use is safe, secure, and trustworthy. And as we've done all of this, we've scrutinized AI trends, not just frontier AI, but also the AI models that will proliferate most widely and rapidly around the world. And we're working to enhance American advantages across the board. But here's the bad news. Our lead is not guaranteed, it is not preordained, and it is not enough to just guard the progress we've made, as historic as it's been. We have to be faster in deploying AI in our national security enterprise than America's rivals are in theirs. They are in a persistent quest to leapfrog our military and intelligence capabilities. And the challenge is even more acute because they are unlikely to be bound by the same principles and responsibilities and values that we are. The stakes are high. If we don't act more intentionally to seize our advantages, if we don't deploy AI more quickly and more comprehensively to strengthen our national security, we risk squandering our hard-earned lead. Even if we have the best AI models, but our competitors are faster to deploy, we could see them seize the advantage in using AI capabilities against our people, our forces, and our partners and allies. We could have the best team, but lose because we didn't put it on the field. We could see advantages we built over decades in other domains, like space and undersea operations, be reduced or eroded entirely with AI-enabled technology. And for all our strengths, there remains a risk of strategic surprise. We have to guard against that, which is why I'm here today. Our new National Security Memorandum on AI seeks to address exactly this set of challenges. And as rising national security leaders, you will be charged with implementing it with no time to lose. So in the balance of my remarks, I want to spend a few minutes explaining the memorandum's three main lines of effort, securing American leadership in AI, harnessing AI for national security, and strengthening international AI partnerships. First, we have to ensure the United States continues to lead the world in developing AI. Our competitors also know how important AI leadership is in today's age of geopolitical competition and they are investing huge resources to seize it for themselves. So we have to start upping our game. And that starts with people. America has to continue to be a magnet for global scientific and tech talent. 
As I noted, we've already taken major steps to make it easier and faster for top AI scientists, engineers, and entrepreneurs to come to the United States, including by removing friction in our visa rules to attract talent from around the world. And through this new memorandum, we're taking more steps, streamlining visa processing wherever we can for applicants working with emerging technologies. And we're calling on Congress to get in the game with us, staple more green cards to STEM diplomas, as President Biden has been pushing to do for years. So that's the people part of the, equa uh, the equation. Next is hardware and power. Developing advanced AI systems requires large volumes of advanced chips. And keeping those AI systems humming requires large amounts of power. On chips, we've taken really significant steps forward. We passed the Chips and Science Act, making a generational investment in our semiconductor manufacturing, including the leading edge logic chips and the high bandwidth memory chips needed for AI. We've also taken decisive action to limit strategic competitors' access to the most advanced chips necessary to train and use frontier AI systems with national security implications, as well as the tools needed to make those chips. The National Security Memorandum builds on this progress by directing all of our national security agencies to make sure that those vital chip supply chains are secure and free from foreign interference. On power, the memorandum recognizes the importance of designing, permitting, and constructing clean energy generation facilities that can serve AI data centers so that the companies building world-leading AI infrastructure build as much as possible here in the United States in a way that is consistent with our climate goals. One thing is for certain. If we don't rapidly build out this infrastructure in the next few years, adding tens or even hundreds of gigawatts of clean power to the grid, we will risk falling behind. Finally, there's funding for innovation. This fiscal year, Federal funding for non-defense R&D declined significantly. And Congress still hasn't appropriated the science part of the Chips and Science Act, even while China is increasing its science and technology budget 10% year over year. That can mean critical gaps in AI R&D. We want to work with Congress to make sure this and the other requirements within the AI National Security Memorandum are funded. And we've received strong bipartisan signals of support for this from the Hill. So it's time for us to collectively roll up our sleeves on a bicameral, bipartisan basis and get this done. And we also have to be aware that our competitors are watching closely, not least because they would love to depose our AI leadership. One playbook we've seen them deploy again and again is theft and espionage. So the National Security Memorandum takes this head on. It establishes addressing adversary threats against our AI sector as a top-tier intelligence priority, a move that means more resources and more personnel will be devoted to combating this threat. It also directs people across government, like so many of you, to work more closely with private sector AI developers to provide them with timely cybersecurity and counterintelligence information to keep their technology secure, just as we've already worked with to protect other elements of the US private sector from threats to them and to our national security. The second pillar focuses on how we harness our advantage and our enduring advantage to advance national security. As National Security Advisor, I see how AI is already poised to transform the national security landscape. And where you sit, as war fighters, as diplomats, as intelligence officers, I'm sure you're seeing it too. Some change is already here. AI is reshaping our logistics, our cyber vulnerability detection, how we analyze and synthesize intelligence. Some change we see looming on the horizon, including AI-enabled applications that will transform the way our military trains and fights. But some change, as I said earlier, we truly cannot predict in both the form it will take and how fast it will come. Bottom line, opportunities are already at hand and more soon will be, so we've got to seize them quickly and effectively, or our competitors will first. That means all of us in the national security enterprise have to become much more adept users of AI. It means we need to make significant technical, organizational, and policy changes to ease collaboration with the actors that are driving this development. And the National Security Memorandum does just that. It directs agencies to propose ways to enable more effective collaboration with non-traditional vendors, 
such as leading AI companies and cloud computing providers. In practice, that means quickly putting the most advanced systems to use in our national security enterprise just after they're developed, like how many in private industry are doing. We need to be getting fast adoption of these systems, which are iterating and advancing, as we see, every few months. Next, today's AI systems are more generally capable than the bespoke and narrow tools that dominated prior AI. And this general capability is a huge advantage. But the flip side is they cost much more to train and run. So we're pushing agencies to use shared computing resources to accelerate AI adoption, lower costs, and learn from one another as they responsibly address a wide range of threats, from nuclear security to biosecurity to cybersecurity. And I emphasize that word, responsibly. Developing and deploying AI safely, securely, and yes, responsibly, is the backbone of our strategy. That includes ensuring that AI systems are free of bias and discrimination. This is profoundly in our self-interest. One reason is that even if we can attract AI talent or foster AI development here in the United States, we won't be able to lead the world if people do not trust our systems. And that means developing standards for AI evaluations, including what makes those systems work and how they might fail in the real world. It means running tests on the world's most advanced AI systems before they're released to the public. And it means leading the way in areas like content authentication and watermarking, so people know when they're interacting with AI as opposed to interacting with, for example, a real human. To do all of that, we have to empower and learn from a full range of AI firms, experts, and entrepreneurs, which our AI Safety Institute is now doing on a daily basis. Another reason we need to focus so much on responsibility, safety, and, and trustworthiness is a little bit counterintuitive. Ensuring security and trustworthiness will actually enable us to move faster, not slow us down. Put simply, uncertainty breeds caution. When we lack confidence about safety and reliability, we're slower to experiment, to adopt, to use new capabilities, and we just can't afford to do that in today's strategic landscape. That's why our memorandum directs the first ever government-wide framework on AI risk management commitments in the national security space. Commitments like refraining from uses that depart from our nation's core values, avoiding harmful bias and discrimination, maximizing accountability, ensuring effective and appropriate human oversight. As I said, preventing misuse and ensuring high standards of accountability will not slow us down. It will actually do the opposite. And we've seen this before with technological change. During the early days of the railroads, for example, the establishment of safety standards enabled trains to run faster thanks to increased certainty, confidence, and compatibility. And I also want to note we're going to update this framework regularly. This goes back to the uncertainty I mentioned earlier. There may be capabilities or novel legal issues that just haven't emerged yet. We must and we will ensure our governance and our guardrails can adapt to meet the moment, no matter what it looks like or how quickly it comes. Finally, we need to do all of this in lockstep with our partners, which is the third pillar of our memorandum. President Biden often says we're going to see more technological change in the next 10 years than we saw in the last 50. He's right. And it doesn't just apply to our country, but to all countries. And when it comes to AI specifically, we need to ensure that people around the world are able to seize the benefits and mitigate the risks. That means building international norms and partnerships around AI. Over the last year, thanks to the leadership of President Biden and Vice President Harris, we've laid that foundation. We developed the first ever international code of conduct on AI with our G7 partners. We joined more than two dozen nations at the Bletchley and Seoul AI summits to outline clear AI principles. We released our political declaration on the military use of AI, which more than 50 countries have endorsed, to outline what constitutes responsible practices for using AI in the military domain. And we sponsored the first ever UN General Assembly resolution on AI, which passed unanimously, including with the PRC, I might add, as a co-sponsor. It makes clear that, as I said, we can both seize the benefits of AI for the world and advance AI safety. Let me take just a moment to speak about the PRC specifically. Almost a year ago, when President Biden and President Xi met in San Francisco, they agreed to a dialogue between our two countries on AI risk and safety. 
And this past May, some of our government's top AI experts met PRC officials in Geneva for a candid and constructive initial conversation. I strongly believe that we should always be willing to engage in dialogue about this technology with the PRC and with others to better understand risks and counter misperceptions. But those meetings do not diminish our deep concerns about the ways in which the PRC continues to use AI to repress its population, spread misinformation, and undermine the security of the United States and our allies and partners. AI should be used to unleash possibilities and empower people. And nations around the world, especially developing economies, want to know how to do that. They don't want to be left behind, and we don't want that either. Our national security has always been stronger when we extend a hand to partners around the world. So we need to get the balance right. We need to balance protecting cutting-edge AI technologies on the one hand, while also promoting AI technology adoption around the world. Protect and promote. We can and must and are doing both. So let me briefly preview for you a new global approach to AI diffusion, how AI can spread around the world in a responsible way that allows AI for good while protecting against downside risk. This new global approach complements the memorandum that has come out and comes out of extended conversations in the Situation Room and with allies, industry, and partners over the last year. The finer print will come out later, but I can say now that it will give the private sector more clarity and predictability as they plan to invest hundreds of billions of dollars globally. This includes how our government will manage the export of the most advanced chips necessary to develop frontier models how we will ensure broad access to substantial AI computing power that lies behind the bleeding edge, but could nonetheless transform health, agriculture, and manufacturing around the world. How we will help facilitate partnerships between leading American AI firms and countries around the world that want to be part of the AI revolution. And how we will set safety and security standards for these partnerships to ensure we effectively protect against risks while unleashing new opportunities. These partnerships are critical. They're fundamental to our leadership. We know that China is building its own technological ecosystem with digital infrastructure that won't protect sensitive data, that can enable mass surveillance and censorship, that can spread misinformation, and that can make countries vulnerable to coercion. So we have to compete to provide a more attractive path, ideally before countries go too far down an untrusted road from which it can be expensive and difficult to return. And that's what we're doing. We've already developed new partnerships that will support economic progress, technological innovation, and indigenous AI ecosystems from Africa to Asia to the Middle East and beyond. And we're going to keep at it with a clear and rigorous approach to AI diffusion. Now, I do want to make sure I leave time for our conversation, so let me just close with this. Everything I just laid out is a plan, but we need all of you to turn it into progress. We need you and leaders across every state and every sector to adopt this technology to advance our national security and to do it fast. We need you to ensure that our work aligns with the core values that have always underpinned American leadership. And as President Eisenhower said, we need you to constantly update and develop our AI doctrine in the years ahead. <clears throat> it will be hard. It will require constant thinking, constant rethinking, constant innovation, constant collaboration, and constant leadership. But with the past as our proof, I know that everyone in this room and all across our country is up for it. And together, we will win the competition for the 21st century. So thank you, and I look forward to the conversation. Good morning. My name is Professor Richard Anderson, the National War College, and I will be moderating the question and answer portion of the talk. But before we started, I just I wanted to say that uh, it's, it's a little bit sobering and quite a bit inspirational uh, to hear this message this morning. And I, I couldn't help thinking about this historically. If 100 years ago, your predecessors here, hearing about air power and the potential role it was going to play might have felt uh, the way that you do this morning. There's a lot of changes coming. So um, with that, I would like to invite the students to, uh, to come up to the microphone to ask any questions that you might have. And 
two reminders uh, this morning. Uh, the first one is please introduce yourself, your name, rank, the service or agency, and the college that you're with. And uh, the second reminder is this is not, repeat, this is not Chatham House rules. The press is in attendance this morning, and so your comments are on the record. <laughs> Sir, thank you for that. Sir, Lieutenant Colonel Mike Gallucci, uh, represent our United States Army, and I'm a very proud member of the Eisenhower School. And to the point about Chatham House rules, all that great stuff, uh, we definitely, uh, some of the students who are more intelligent than I helped me make this question just right to get the essence of it and <laughs> keep it in the box. So that being said, uh, sir, for decades, the theocratic state regime in Iran played a, now a significant role in the largely destabilized Middle East. And we've been hearing about over the last several years that the media has shown that Iranian youth are potentially ready for a paradigm shift into a, a different type of government. So that being said, uh, perhaps if that were to happen, uh, what would be the implications for our United States and how might those implications drive foreign policy uh, in the Middle East moving forward? Again, sir, thank you very much, appreciate the time. Thank you and thank you for your service. Um, we start from the premise that Iran represents a destabilizing and dangerous threat to American interests and the interests of our allies and partners across the Middle East and beyond. Uh, that's true in the way that they fund and fuel proxies who are attacking our troops, attacking our friends, uh, and are undermining a vision of peace and stability for the Middle East that countries of good faith have been pursuing for a long time. So we are clear-eyed about the threat that Iran poses, and we have been working across a range of national security tools to push back against that threat and to support our partners in pushing back against that threat. And maybe there's no more real-world, in-living-color example of that than the fact that uh, our brave men and women helped directly defend Israel against a rainfall of Iranian ballistic missiles just a few weeks ago. Uh, rendering that attack ineffective and helping protect our partner and showing also that we have the capacity and the wherewithal to stand up and defend against the kind of threat that Iran poses. Iran also poses a threat insofar as we continue to have grave concerns about its nuclear program and we are determined to prevent Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon. But the essence of your question is really about the future of Iran's political system. Here, our view is quite straightforward. We believe <clears throat> that the future of Iran should be up to the Iranian people. Um, and we do not believe that the United States has a particularly good track record of designing policy to try to generate regime change in other countries, that that should be what we do. What, what we should do is design a strategy to push back against their malign activities and behavior across the region and then stand on principle and in support of universal human rights and values and the proposition that the Iranian people should be able to chart a course for their own future consistent with those universal, universal rights and values. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Uh, good morning, sir. Lieutenant Colonel Mike Walls, United States Marine Corps, Eisenhower School. Sir, I'm wonder, uh, wondering if you wouldn't mind speaking to what, what are some of the sources of our hesitation or resistance to allowing Ukraine uh, to employ American-provided or NATO-provided weapon systems against valid military targets on the territory of the Russian Federation. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for that. So first, I, I want to start by saying, and, and I know many people in this room have worked on it, and I see some, some folks um, in uniform who I personally had the chance, who are sitting here today, who I personally had the chance uh, to sit with and work through how do we deliver for Ukraine an immense array of capabilities to defend their sovereignty and territorial integrity. And I'm immensely proud of the two and a half years of effort that we have put in mobilizing a massive quantity and um, uh, extent of capability for Ukraine. Second, um, we do in fact allow the use of US systems directly across the border in NATO on the common sense principle that if you've got an artillery system firing at you from across the border in Kharkiv or elsewhere along that Ukrainian-Russian <coughs> frontier, you ought to be able to fire back. Uh, the question has been about uh, long-range strike and the use of long-range strike into Russia. And the position uh, of the administration to date has been not to permit the use of long-range strike into Russia. Uh, President Biden and President Zelensky have had the opportunity to discuss this, including most recently 
when President Zelensky and he spoke by telephone last week. And um, seeing as how we're not in Chatham House rules here today, and seeing as how I want to allow those conversations to continue, I will just say our policy hasn't changed at this point, uh, but those conversations will continue. And I think that they are best uh, conducted um, in, in closed, behind closed doors so that we can work through the puts and takes of this issue with our Ukrainian partners. Thank you. So before we go to the next student question, I wanted to take prerogative here as moderator and, and ask if I could follow up. You had mentioned fast uh, adoption. And this has been a perennial problem with the Department of Defense in particular. So I thought with this audience, this might be an opportunity to address how, how might we do that in, in light of some of the delays we've had with weapons systems and adoption in the past. If you had any thoughts on that. Uh, w when you say, how might we do that with, when we've had delays in the past? I'm, I'm thinking about uh, weapon systems that take two to three decades yeah. uh, from conception until fielding the actual product. And I was wondering if with artificial intelligence, there, there might be some way to make that work faster, to get that into the battlefield, to get that into the hands of war well, Look, it means, it means dramatically reimagining our acquisition and pr procurement system, our, feel, our testing, validating, and fielding system. And it will also mean what FDR once called bold and persistent experimentation and risk taking. And that means all of us getting a bit out of our comfort zones. We have to make sure that we are doing things in a responsible way. And part of what the NSM does is set the guardrails uh, and create a framework that then tells people, go, innovate, experiment, adopt. Um, but it's been interesting, just coming back to this last question about Ukraine, to watch a, a real live example of the rapid adoption and iteration of technology, including AI-enabled technology, on the battlefield. And that has required a constant give and take, an iteration that um, each side is learning in ways that force us to adopt and alter, for example, UAV technology, update software, uh, adjust electronic warfare capabilities, uh, deal with jamming environments in new and, and distinct ways. And actually, out of the last two and a half years of the war against Ukraine, the United States military has le learned an enormous amount about this and has started to put some of those lessons to work. So from my perspective, um, this should be absolutely the kind of textbook we can then apply to reshape the US military across the board in terms of its ability to rapidly adopt and iterate this technology. And what makes this technology different is it's not just about the long lead time for a, you know, a pre precision strike missile or an aircraft or a surface combatant. This is about a combination of hardware and software where the weapon system as it looks today might look slightly different a month from now and then slightly different from that a month later and so forth. And we need an entire ecosystem of development, procurement, and deployment that is different from how we've thought about the more static systems that we put to work today. Uh, the good news is that there is great work underway at the DOD through Replicator and other initiatives to try to do this, but it's going to have to be thought of less as hey, we have a particular initiative on technology and more as this is just the way we do business across every element of our acquisition and procurement system. Thank you. Mel. Good morning and thank you very much for your time. My name is Fiona Saunders. I'm one of the private sector fellows um, at the Eisenhower School and I am from IBM. Um, like many of my esteemed colleagues from the private sector, um, we work with our DOD partners, and um, I was wondering if you had put any thought into how we might work maybe through private sector, um, public-private partnerships or something, so you don't end up with an instance of AI and um, how it's implemented at the Navy that is different from the Army, that is different from the Marine Corps, and um, which wouldn't benefit the taxpayer. Yeah, thank you. Actually, if if you think about the second pillar of the National Security Memorandum, what it actually tries to do is put down a roadmap that says, here's how the national security enterprise, uh, the joint force, the intelligence community should work with private sector partners, and here's how the, you can work in a transparent, um, effective, and yes, legal way uh, 
to make sure that we are adopting private sector developed technologies, capabilities, and solutions into the force, into our intelligence community in a way that's also shared across the entire national security enterprise. So the whole uh, design of this second pillar is about answering your question. How do we take a solution that IBM has developed that has applications for warfighting or for logistics or for intelligence analysis, incorporate it, and then also make sure that it is um, available on a consistent basis across the board and that we're not setting up multiple different competing or inconsistent solutions. Now, before this NSM was passed, some of this work was getting done in a patchwork way by, um, you know, entrepreneurial people within the various services. But for the first time, we now have a framework to say, here is a demand signal to industry. We want what you are offering. We want to incorporate it rapidly, effectively, comprehensively, and in a way that reduces overlap, gaps, and, and, conf and, and conflicts. Now, I said at the end of my remarks, we've set out the plan, now it's going to be up to all of you to implement it, right? The proof will be in the pudding in the actual execution of that. But the core insight that we've come to in the last couple of years is that we're ahead when it comes to the latent capability. The United States has the best latent capability on AI in the world. How do we transform that into actual application on the battlefield, in our logistics, in our um, uh, intelligence enterprise? And there, it is going to require, it is going to have to be, you use the word public-private partnership. Oftentimes, we think of that as this kind of you know, bespoke thing, that's just going to have to be the watchword of the entire effort because this technology has to such a significant extent been developed and advanced in the private sector and it's one of the things that makes AI different and it's the thing that is going to have to make our whole approach different. Thank you very much for your time. Right, thank you. Uh, sir. Good morning, sir. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Blake Jackson with the United States Marine Corps and I'm a student at the Eisenhower School. Uh, I would like to further explore the juxtaposition of collaboration and competition. In light of the U.S. national security strategy, particularly regarding competition with China, are there markets, sectors, or capabilities where cooperation could enhance global security without compromising U.S. strategic interests? Conversely, in addition to what sectors you've already addressed, where else is competition essential to protect and advance our national security? Thank you. So when President Biden and President Xi met um, for a summit in, in Woodside in San Francisco about a year ago, they actually agreed on some areas where the U.S. and China should work together where our interests align and converge. I'll give you a couple examples. One of them is counter-narcotics. Uh, many of the fentanyl precursors that flow into Mexico to be formed into the pills that come into this country and kill Americans emanate in the first place from China. And so we wanted to work with the PRC to place greater uh, restraint and regulation on those precursors so that flow was stemmed. And over the course of the last year, we've made progress on that. And that's thanks to incredible work from DHS, DOJ, uh, other agencies of the US government. Uh, but there's more work to do on that front. But it is an example of where actually a threat to the United States, but also a global threat, the global threat of synthetic opioids, can be met in part by work together between the United States and China. Climate is another example. John Podesta, the president's senior climate envoy, was recently in Beijing, particularly focused on uh, certain noxious gases and the work the U.S. and China can do together, and we have examples of, over the course of the past decade where we have been able to make some progress in that area. But our view all along has been that there is nothing inconsistent with pursuing that kind of collaboration where our interests converge and also competing vigorously where they do not converge, whether it's in the military domain or in the technology domain or in the diplomatic domain where we see China taking steps that are coercive and counter to what we see as kind of universal principles or the United Nations Charter. So we have to be able to do both at the same time. And the president has designed a strategy where we compete intensively, but we manage that competition responsibly so it doesn't veer into conflict, and it preserves this space to work together on certain issues. 
The last point I would make is all of this requires intense diplomacy at a leader level and at all levels below that. And it also requires extensive military-to-military -military communications. I was in China uh, at the end of August and had the opportunity to meet with the vice chairman of the Chinese Military Commission. Um, this is the first time that an American official has met with basically the top ranking uniform in China in nearly a decade. And it goes to show you that we don't have the, the depth of engagement at a mill mill level we need, and that's because China has historically been resistant to that. Over the last couple of years, that's opened up quite a bit. Secretary Austin, Chairman Brown, others, including Admiral Paparo, have had the opportunity to engage their counterparts. We need to sustain that because um, the only way that we are going to effectively manage this competition is to maintain a thickness and a frequency of engagement at every level, and particularly with respect to military to military communication. Thank you very much. Uh, so before we go on, I, I would ask, can we prioritize questions on artificial intelligence? <laughs> All of your questions are, are welcome, but if you have a question on artificial intelligence, uh, would you move to the front of the line, please? <laughs> Okay, uh, in that case, sir, over to you. <laughs> your questions are welcome. I just, your, your, all of your questions are welcome. I'd just like to prioritize artificial intelligence, if I could. Thank you. Good morning, sir. Lieutenant Colonel Axel Gonzalez, United States Air Force Intelligence with the mighty College of Information in Cyberspace. In addition to AI, the holistic application of the information instrument of power, what are key opportunities you see to evolve its effectiveness in strategic competition? At least the question said AI in it. So, <laughs> so that's good. Good start. Um, I, was, uh, I was giving remarks yesterday uh, on uh, our foreign economic policy, international economics, and the questions were meant to be on international economics. And, and an enterprising reporter managed to say, you're talking about the international economy. The Middle East is part of the international economy. So let me ask you a question about the Middle East. It was quite, it was good, it was good. Um, no, but I, I don't mean to make light of the question, which is a really important question. And we are seeing in real time the ways in which our competitors and adversaries use a vertically integrated strategy of information warfare to shape global narratives, to try to divide, distract, and undermine confidence in our own country, our institutions, our democracy, our staying power, our capacity. And we gotta be on the field to be able to effectively push back. And I think this does require a whole of government approach where uh, I see two real challenges. One of them has to do with silos. DOD has significant information operations enterprise through the MISO program and others. Uh, the State Department has the GEC, the Global Engagement Center. Other elements of our government have tools that they use, and it's incumbent upon us, and I would say that we get a grade of incomplete for trying to bring those silos together so that we have a more whole of government approach on this. And the second piece is that we have to carry out this effort with respect to information warfare as a democracy that doesn't do state-run propaganda and have just arms of misinformation spread everywhere. We gotta do it consistent with our values in our ways. And that may seem at first blush like that's a disadvantage. But if you take the capacity and soft power and communications platform of every element of the United States, our government, our society, our people, we should be able to more effectively harness um, innovative ways of communicating that aren't just the kind of top-down info ops style of doing things, but really take advantage of um, the creativity and capacity of, uh, you know, of the American information ecosystem. That's at 30,000 feet. How that plays out in practice is, again, something that I think we deserve a grade of incomplete on because um, we are not where we should be on that front. But it, the combination of trying to make this whole of government and then trying to make it whole of society because we're just, we have a different mode of operating with information operations or information warfare than our adversaries who are not democracies, this for me is the way that we will make progress on this issue. Thank you, sir. All right, ma'am. 
Good morning. And my question actually relates to what you just said. I'm Anne Say Chadre. I'm with the National War College State Department, and I come out of the public diplomacy cone. Uh, in recent days, we've seen uh, headlines that Russian disinformation is once again pouring into our information ecosystem uh, and has the potential to upset the results of our 2024 presidential election. As you just said, um, research, research that I've done at the War College indicates that our interagency response to information warfare by foreign actors is insufficient and uh, not very well coordinated. So given state actors like Russia are so good at this, how can we enhance our capabilities using influence AI to both identify disinformation and create our own narratives? And since you just talked about breaking down silos, what do you think about the idea of having sort of an information czar maybe at the National Security Council or another actor that will have sort of an overall view on protecting information resiliency in our domestic environment? Thanks. It's a good question on the information czar. One challenge, just to be straightforward, is that a lot of these questions around information operations, um, around public diplomacy, around the voice that America uses to speak to the world, bleed over into questions of propaganda or politics. Um, and so the question is, should the White House be the central locus for this effort, or should it actually be distributed to an agency? Should this be a case where you have a lead agency model? One agency is in charge, and they're sort of running it, but it's kept one step removed from the White House. I think on the czar, that's something we've been grappling with and thinking about. Um, you know, across the national security enterprise and, and under NSM2, most decision making does get kind of brought into the NSC process, but this may be an area where actually a lead agency model is a more effective way of setting up for long-term success that insulates this from the twos and fro's of politics on both sides. That's not just, by the way, about the election interference issues, it's about the larger question of how we decide messages we communicate, how we decide what messages we combat, um, which are fraught. Uh, it's, and, and that goes to the point about how we're a democracy and it's not a situation where you know, a small group of unelected people sitting in a foreign capital are saying, this is what we're gonna go drive, just go do it and lie and cheat and you know, hide and so forth. We can't do that, so we have to have something that's kind of consistent with the political system that we're dealing with. With respect to how we get better, I think we have actually made substantial progress over the last eight years, but there's a long way to go. From when we first, you know, the first major election we saw significant uh, Russian information operations to today, where we see it from Russia, we see it from Iran, we see it from other countries. And um, we now have systems in place that actually can pretty rapidly identify deep fakes and, um, and call them out. And we just saw an example of this over the course of the last few days where the system worked. I'd like to shorten the string so it works faster and it works in more cases, but I believe that as we exercise this muscle going forward, we can continue to make progress. Um, we are not where we need to be, I acknowledge that, but I think we are continuing to move forward in a way where this is a top flight priority uh, for our intelligence community, for our law enforcement, for our NSA and cybercom officials who are looking at foreign actors engaging in disruptive cyber attacks as part of this effort uh, to undermine the US election. And regardless of whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, you should look at this as a national security issue, as an attack on our country, and think, what can we collectively do to harden our resilience. The last point that I would make is I just think the awareness, a big part of success here is not just stopping every tweet or video. We should do as much of that as possible. It's raising resilience by raising awareness, having people understand when they're looking at something or consuming something, hey, this very well could be have a foreign actor provenance to it. I think we've made progress on that, but there's a long way to go to get to where we need to be. Do you think we have time for one or two more questions? Sure. Okay, excellent. Uh, please. Uh, morning, sir. Colonel Paul Albuquerque, United States Air Force from National War College. Uh, on the topic of AI, today our digital shadow, the data that we just put out from using apps uh, and hardware is collected by companies. 
uh, and it's a major industry for them. Um, with the abilities of AI to uh, collect that data and then potentially use it to influence customers, the American population, what sort of guardrails or restrictions do you think need to be put in place with those corporations to ensure privacy and uh, minimizing undue influence on the U.S. population? Uh, look, I think there has to be an element of transparency and choice. Transparency about what the data privacy uh, parameters are with a given AI model. Customers should understand what their data is being used for and how uh, it is being used with respect to them or bundled up and sold off. Or for that matter, sold to foreign competitors. And in fact, we have a data security rule making its way uh, into final form right now to deal with certain sensitive data that historically has been able to go to countries of concern, like the PRC, that should not be going there. But on the more day-to-day -day manifestation of this, as you're describing, we should start with people understanding and then having choices about what data that they want to share and not share. And we have with respect to um, cookies on websites or um, other data being collected by uh, technology companies, some experience now over the course of the past few years, and we just need to adapt that, in my view, from kind of existing online platforms to frontier AI models or the APIs of a, of a chat GPT or what have you. And I think that there is a common sense way to do this where you can take advantage effectively of this technology but also have some agency in ensuring your data is not used in ways that you're not comfortable with. So we're running low on time, but I think I'm going to cheat. And I'm going to ask if the next, uh, the, both of you, could please give your questions. And this will be our last question for the day. Great. Good morning. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Kelsey Rouse, the United States Army from the Eisenhower School. And pulling again on the ethics piece on AI, uh, you briefly touched it on the previous two questions. So how does the American public, along with strategic leaders, properly have the discussion about ethics? When AI right now, when we talk about certain types of controls, it can be seen as an actual infringement on civil rights within a free democracy. Uh, that is actually very similar to my question as well, so we'll just go with that one. Thank you. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> That's great. Well, look, a big part of the National Security Memorandum is actually um, setting out some basic principles that, you know, we didn't pull out of thin air, that have been the product of years of work now on bias and discrimination, on privacy, on civil liberties, on safety and trustworthiness. And that work now manifests itself uh, in a number of different guidelines that the U.S. government has put forward. Um, and not just put forward ourselves, but then tried to work with other countries in kind of concentric circles, the G7, our closest partners, um, you know, a larger group that came together at the Bletchley and Seoul AI summits, and ultimately the UN General Assembly, to try to set out a series of principles for how this should be uh, effectively used. And then there's the question of accountability and oversight. And part of what the National Security Memorandum does is say, it's not good enough to say this is how AI should and shouldn't be used. We need mechanisms to enforce that within our government, whether it's the responsible use of AI for military purposes or for intelligence gathering purposes or intelligence analysis purposes or uh, whether it's something as simple as just the commercial application of AI and how each of us should feel safe and secure as Americans that we are not being harmed through its use. So basically, we have built over the course of the last couple of years, I think, a pretty good set of markers, right and left rules of the road, that try to get at these questions of fundamental values. And then what the National Security Memorandum tries to do is say, um, Here's our guidelines. Uh, now, here's how they have to be implemented with special care in the national security space because of the unique risks that come with the national security space. And here's how we need to set up oversight and accountability in a transparent way to make sure that we are holding ourselves accountable. And I can tell you when we were talking to the president about the National Security Memorandum, and we had multiple meetings with him about this because he didn't just take it and say, okay, fine. We went back and forth on this over the course of the past two or three months. 
This was one of his questions. How do we really make sure on a rigorous basis, not just that we've set forth standards that make sense to us, but how can we have confidence through thick and through thin, through crisis and contingency, they're actually going to be enforced and not run roughshod over. And that is a big part of what this NSM is trying to achieve. The last point is, I talked a lot about the uncertainty of this technology. So you can have principles around human oversight, around privacy, around uh, bias or discrimination today, and the technology can evolve in ways that make what you've said today seem somewhat anachronistic tomorrow. So the other thing that we've done is built in the need to constantly update and adapt this as we go, just as we need to adapt a drone on a battlefield, we need to adapt the values and guardrails side of this as well to keep pace with the technology and the lessons we learn from the evolution of that technology. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And I'd like to close by inviting Admiral Garvin to, uh, to closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be exceptionally brief. Uh, just a, a quick thank you again, sir. We, we all can imagine what your schedule must be like, and so the ability to spend some time with, the, with you this morning is absolutely priceless. So thank you. Another round of applause for the National Security Advisor.